Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, a free site. Bettingangle.us, a free site. It is Sunday, December 12th, 2021. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, let me just say, before I dive into a few fights here, right, let's talk about what you, the public, want from Saul Alvarez. What I want people to do is to go to my community page on YouTube, right? The account is Dwyer70905. And what you're gonna find is that I placed a poll on that community site and you're gonna find that most of you don't want Canelo fighting Makabu for the cruiserweight title if that means that Makabu has to lose weight to get to 190 pounds, right? You don't want that. You don't want Canelo picking up a weight drain title. Understand the WBC has come up with what they call the Bridger weight division. And so incredibly, it's champions in a weight class that has a 200 pound weight limit are now gonna have to operate at 190 pounds. No, your next move the move you want Canelo to make is to fight David Benavides at 168 pounds. You want that even more than Canelo calling out the light heavyweight champion. Again, I encourage people to vote. I encourage people to go to my community page and to look at the more than 200 votes on this poll right now. Now let's talk about the Lomachenko-Richard Comey fight. First, let me say, great ring announcer. Understand, life continues. We're going to have a changing of the guard, right? People like Michael Buffer eventually are going to have to retire, right? Great ring announcer. I encourage people to listen to him. Innovative way to introduce a fight. Uses the phrase, oh baby, and it works. Now, let's talk about the gambling. The over eight and a half rounds delivered, right? Subscribers here should be happy. Instead of a minus 1,299, which is what you would have gotten taken Lomachenko straight up, you got a minus 118, significantly better odds with a hedge, right? Had Comey won, you would have made money there too. And, of course, the minus 118 delivered. The pre-fight video is still up. But let me do a mea culpa here. I admit I should have lost this bet. Right? I'm not going to cry about it. I'll, I'll take the sports book's money. But I should have lost this bet. Because in the seventh round, Loma comes out. He has a left hand. He's in a southpaw stance. He has a left hand that he can vary. Now, the guys announcing the fight missed it in real time. But Loma lands a bomb left hand. Right? He lands a very hard left hand. And Comey is dazed and confused. So Comey goes over to the ropes. He's perplexed. Loma cuts off the ring. Loma then comes back with another bomb left hand right heavy left hand and Comey goes down hard right so hard that Loma in we'll call it an Ali Floyd Mayweather move starts talking to Comey's corner telling them to stop the fight Quite frankly, referee Steve Willis should have stopped the fight. I should have lost this bet. Right? I'm not crying over spilled milk because I won the bet. What I'm saying, though, is just keeping it real, keeping it 100. I should have lost this bet. It's so bad that when Comey gets back up, and I give Comey credit on surviving the round. He does survive the round. But understand, there's a moment after he gets off the canvas where you notice he has no balance. His One of his legs is not cooperating. I believe it's his right leg is not cooperating. And instead of just closing the show, Loma, like Larry Holmes, 
against Ali. Right? Motions to the corner to stop the fight. Ref lets it continue. Loma starts battering Comey again, but Comey is able to survive the round. Right? Had the referee stopped the fight in the seventh round, I would have lost the bet. Let's talk about um, Loma's edge. And it's a decided edge. Folks, you're talking about excellent body control, right? Boxing is a lot more than punches and punches landed. Here, we're talking about the period between the punches, where Loma is setting things up. You're simply not going to find better body control than you are with Lomachenko. Right? Let me say this politely. I would not hesitate in taking Loma over Devin Haney or George Kambosis. Right? The body language, the body control was in full force. Understand as Loma is jumping around the ring with lateral movement and body control, he has his defense intact. In other words, if Comey guesses right that Loma is going to jump toward Comey's left, and if Comey throws a punch, chances are Loma is going to have that blocked. Understand, too, you're fighting really a counter-punching cat. But Loma is able to get clean punches. I mean, completely clean. Because Loma will jump to a side and he'll try out the punch without throwing the punch right he's kinda like Lennox Lewis here where he does things to get you in certain positions he's bouncing around he sees he can hit you from a certain position with the left hand without throwing it right he's moved to that side you're unprotected on the right side of your face right and Loma of course is ambidextrous he fights most of this fight out of a southpaw stance. Just understand, Loma is moving around without throwing punches, then when he moves around and he throws the punch, he knows it's going to land. The reason that's important is Loma, who's not a big puncher, is able to load up on punches in those situations. Let me also say that Comey and I give him credit. He's the fighter in the early rounds trying to throw a jab, trying to get things going, right? Uh, he's there throwing volume, but he's not defensively blessed. He and Loma are practically in different sports, right? Comey's the guy who wants to get close to you and then throw combinations, right? By contrast, Loma is the guy who's moving around the ring. It's kind of like a gymnastics exercise. He's moving around the ring. He's seeing where you are. He's seeing what shots are open. Then when he's ready, he's throwing the shots. Now, they showed an interesting graphic during the fight where Comey was landing more than 50% of his body shots. Right? More than 50% of his body shots. His corner, Danny Jacobs' old trainer, Andre Rosier, was telling him, hey, you have to commit to that. What that meant was against this guy with some of the best legs in boxing. Right? Some of the best body control. I would say the best body control in boxing. What Comey's corner was telling him was you need to track down Lomachenko. You need to go to the body. You need to be on your front foot. Let's remember, Loma lost the fight to Orlando Salido. Loma's first professional loss. When Salido did just that. Right? But what I found is you can't turn a guy into a committed body puncher. Right? It happens from time to time. I did see... Anthony Yard recently changed tactics in his Lyndon Arthur rematch and come inside, fight small, go to the body. Richard Comey is a hunter by contrast. He's a combination puncher. He was firmly convinced 
that he was going to be able to hunt down Lomachenko. He didn't want to be limited to the body. I want people to look at the punch stats on the body punches. Comey had success there. Comey's corner wanted him to target there. Comey, even though he's landing shots there at a high percentage, just couldn't make that commitment. It cost him the fight. Right, so where does that leave us? That leaves Lomachenko on the outside, folks, because Cambosis and Haney have shares of the title. They have an opportunity to fight in a unification match. To both guys, let me just say, I don't care how much you're offered to fight Lomachenko. I believe you need to go for history. Right? You don't get the opportunity in your career to be undisputed that often. Right? Just just think about what Anthony Joshua and Deontay Wilder lost by not fighting their undisputed at least for the belts. Right? Not for the lineal. They had an opportunity to fight for all the belts at heavyweight and didn't close the show. I don't care how prestigious fighting Lomachenko is. I believe Devin Haney and George Cambosis, quite frankly, need to fight each other. Had there be an undisputed champion at lightweight, major division, then that undisputed person can pivot to fight Lomachenko. Understand, too, what could happen. Somebody could insist on a rematch clause, right? That happens in boxing. You remember um, Deontay Wilder and Tyson Fury, their rematches, right? Devin Haney could end up fighting George Cambosis over the next year, right? First fight in six months, next fight six months after that. Loma's older. That could put Loma on the back burner for some time. Understand, according to rumor, Teofimo Lopez, who beat Loma, but who isn't the same fighter right now, let's be real, his defense degraded against Cambosis. It's my understanding that he's going to go up to 140. So what that means is Loma, arguably the best fighter in the weight class now that Lopez has left the weight class might be on the outside for at least the next 12 months. Let's shift gears. You know, the next generation is already in the building. Because it's the heavyweight division, let me leave momentarily the lightweight division. And let's talk about a fighter who I believe is going to be the next great heavyweight. Right now, the division has been dominated by big men. Right? We talked over the last two, three years of my feeling that the cruiserweight division was going to invade the heavyweight division because, quite frankly, some of the guys at heavyweight, Wilder, Joshua, just didn't seem to me to have the dexterity to hang with elite cruiserweights right now who, let's face it, have had a golden age. Right? It's not often you have this much talent coming out of one weight class. Murat Gassiev, quite frankly, is one of the better cruiserweights I've seen. The problem is he was in a division with Maris Bredis and with, of course, current heavyweight champ Alexander Usyk. Well, guess what? Usyk went to heavyweight and Usyk won a share of the title. Right? He's now going to fight Tyson Fury. Right? If Joshua steps aside, according to polling here in the community section of my YouTube account, Dwyer70905, most of you want Joshua to step aside. Right? The feeling is Joshua is not going to improve that much in the rematch. Keep in mind, this is a fighter who won his rematch 
against Andy Ruiz. But people understand Usyk is a special heavyweight. Joshua is just one of the top heavyweights of the moment. So you want Joshua to step aside so we could have a unification match between Usyk, who has the belts Joshua used to have, and of course Tyson Fury, not only the WBC champion, but who's also the lineal champion. Understand, Fury has not lost professionally. He certainly hasn't lost professionally since he beat Vladimir Klitschko years ago. Well, let's talk about a young guy. He's not that young, actually. He's 29 years old, who I believe might be able to run through the rest of the division. In my favorites folder right now, I have a film of Philip Ergervik, 29 bronze medal winner, from the 2016 Olympics. Spanking. That's the only word I could use. Spanking. Deontay Wilder in a sparring session. Right, folks, understand. Ergovic is bringing something to the heavyweight division we really haven't had that much of. And that's length. Right? I know it sounds odd in this big heavyweight era, but understand only Tyson Fury, in my opinion, can fight as long as Ergovic. And by long, I mean the kind of big man who you have to reach all the way across the pocket to try to hit. Ergovic has spectacular legs spectacular legs. He's that fighter who has sparred with a lot of studs, hasn't fought them professionally, but has fought them in sparring. And you notice, let's be kind here, there's a talent gap between him and Deontay Wilder. Right? Ergovic can loop his punches. It's very hard to block his shots because like Nakatani, like Golovkin, the shot is a little bit unorthodox. So Ergovic always seems to be able to hit you on the side of the head. And he can do that from distance. Let's just say that if he fights Dylan White, Anthony Joshua, This fighter would be, and I'm just speaking for myself, I know a lot of the boxing community disagrees with me, this fighter would be my betting play. Let's say this too. I believe Usyk, who has a chance against Fury, but I believe Usyk would have a problem with this guy. Because this guy moves well, and the reach difference would become a factor. In other words, if a boxing match broke out, Usyk wouldn't be close to Urkovic like he was close to Anthony Joshua in the 12th round of their fight. Keep an eye on this guy. I believe the way boxing works is you can actually be one of the very best in a division. Take Loma right now in 135 and be frozen out. Right? How many title shots has Virgil Ortiz gotten? Has Boots Ennis gotten? Right? Just understand, there's talent that might not be the highest ranked talent right now that I believe in time is going to pose a major threat to the title holders. Let me say this too. The heavyweight division, remember Dwyer's Law of Relativity. Guys age more slowly at heavyweight. The fact that Ergovic is 29 years old makes him a young pup at heavyweight. Keep an eye on him. Let's get back to 135. Let's talk about Devin Haney against Jojo Diaz. Now let me say this. Haney won the fight. Great. Haney's unbeaten. 
Still has some of the best legs in boxing. I didn't like his center of gravity. I don't think Haney knows how to move around the ring as well as, let's say, a Lomachenko. Right? What I want people to do is to just think about Vitaly Klitschko, one of the best heavyweights I've seen, by the way. Right? As I see it, over the last, let's say, 25 years, I would say the top three heavyweights I've seen are Lennox Lewis, in no particular order, Lennox Lewis, Tyson Fury, and Vitaly Klitschko. Vitaly Klitschko had a lean going where he could fight an aggressive fighter like a Chris Ariola, prime Chris Ariola. Right? Ariola could be on his front foot aggressively crashing the pocket and still couldn't find Vitaly Klitschko because Klitschko understood length. He understood how to lean backward. Now you mean to tell me that Devin Haney is fighting a guy, Jojo Diaz, who you know is going to be on his front foot. Folks, you knew that coming into the fight. You understand, too, that Jojo Diaz doesn't have a big punch. He's relatively new to the weight class. And let's just say, and Haney's in his early 20s. Now's the time. Now is the time to figure out your defense. Right? If you ignore defense until your late 20s, good luck. Right? You're going to end up like Anthony Joshua. Things that a defensive fighter just has ingrained in him. You're not going to have. So Devin Haney right now has great legs, right? He's beating guys. He's able to do certain things that his opposition can't do. He could focus on beating his current opposition or he can focus on beating the opposition he's going to encounter later in his career when he's fighting better fighters. Right, Devin Haney was leaning forward, giving away his height against Jojo Diaz. Understand, too, and I'm going to name this guy in almost every other video, because when I'm talking about fighters, people need to understand the way it's supposed to be. If Jojo Diaz were facing a Floyd Mayweather, Mayweather would not be working as hard as Devin Haney. Right, Diaz, I'm not saying he's a scrub. He's an excellent fighter. But Diaz is a predictable fighter. You know he's not going to break out a back foot game. You know he's coming forward. A Mayweather would have kept Diaz on his shoulder. Right, a Mayweather wouldn't be moving as much as Devin Haney. Also, when Diaz starts reaching, right, Diaz is the smaller fighter. When Diaz starts reaching, a Mayweather would know how to move his upper body back. A Vitaly Klitschko knows how to move his upper body back. A Pernell Whitaker knows how to move his upper body back. Right, Devin Haney, a little bit too hardwired. He's going to have to, quite frankly, become a little bit more limber. And I'm talking about a guy who's a great athlete. But he's leaning forward, I believe his game, was to hit Jojo Diaz in the body. Right? Haney throws a lot of right hands to Jojo Diaz's body. Knowing that Diaz has had a problem with a cut on his eye. Right? So, of course, it, it's blown up in multiple fights. So, I believe Haney was trying to hit Diaz to the body, knowing that Diaz's guard was high because he had to cover the eye with all the scar tissue. And I think Haney was hoping Diaz would lower his guard so he could open up that eye up top. Right? Let's just say I believe he needs a more diversified playbook. He needs a playbook where he thinks, okay, look, I'm not going to back up to the ropes every time. I'm not going to be leaning forward trying to throw straight right hands to this guy's body. 
I applaud him on the commitment to the body punching. But let's just say I would have liked to have seen some hooks and some punches with some leverage. I would have liked to have seen Haney sit down on some shots. Right? You're fighting a guy who's just come to 135. You know he's going to be inside. You know he has an eye with some scar tissue. Why wouldn't you open up a little bit? Right, let's just say I congratulate Haney on the win. Entering the ring, the person on TV said Haney wants to be considered with the Sugar Ray Leonard's of the world. Right, he, he wants to be on the tip of your tongue when you're talking about the best fighters you've seen. Haney has a lot of work to do if that's his standard. Understand, too, I know it sounds like I'm picking on Devin Haney, folks. When we're talking about the top of the sport, the standards are very high. We pick on fighters who have a lot of potential. Haney's still young enough where he can tighten up his defense. He's an athlete. He has the athleticism. He needs to get after it against a shorter fighter like this who isn't a big puncher Haney shouldn't be leaning forward as much as he is what would have happened if Haney was leaning forward like this against a Saul Alvarez you saw what happened to Billy Joe Saunders when he's leaning forward right Haney needs a defensive construct where sure he has great legs but he could also lean back take a look at the Loma fight Loma's moving around. He has great legs. He has great body control. But there are times when the punch comes and Loma leans back. Right? Loma knows how to disengage. Make the fight easier. Haney's still a work in progress. Let's talk about a couple more fights. Right? Now I have this fight in my favorites folder. Right, Dimitri Bivol against Umar Salamov. Folks, let's just put it this way, and I know it's Bivol. I apologize for butchering names. At light heavyweight, I understand Arthur Berturbiev is more popular than Bivol. I understand as we think about Canelo's next move, the light heavyweight division, where Canelo's already fought and beat Kovalev has to come to mind. I know Canelo is more popular than Bevel, Dimitri Bevel. I consider Bevel to be one of the best in the sport, pound for pound, betting wise, and I'm just talking for myself. I'm taking Bevel against anybody else at light heavyweight, and that includes Baturbiev and Canelo. Right, I would take Bevel against David Benavides if Benavides jumps to light heavyweight. Here he's fighting Umar Salamov 26 and 1 with 19 KOs. Understand, Salamov very well connected. His trainer is Kevin Barry, the guy who beat Holofield in the 84 Olympics. The guy who trains Joseph Parker. Right now, just understand that like Lomachenko, Bevel has some of the best legs in boxing. He has too much timing for Solomov. Heavy right hand Solomov has. Can't quite get the gun out the holster because he's dealing with a guy with great counterpunching ability, great legs, great lateral movement right who can just spin around the pocket as you look at the film again it's in my favorites folder just focus on Bevel's legs right this guy's unbeaten he has a share of the title at light heavy it's a shame people don't know more about him right let's just say this guy's a world-class fighter puts his punches together very well. He's a technician in the pocket. He has the kind of legs where as you move forward, he could just jump backward. Right? He's already beaten people like Jean Pascal. He's a major talent. 
he threw down one of the best performances of the weekend. We aren't hearing as much about it in the United States as we should because the fight took place in Russia. Right? But just to understand, this guy is a major talent. Solomov has a sledgehammer right hand. It was neutralized. Let me f mention one more fight. You know, Chris Algieri really does have great legs. There's no other way to look at it. Right? The knockdown in like the second round was a non-knockdown. No punch landed. The guy's legs got tangled. The ref made the bad call. Understand, Algieri can just go on his back foot and avoid a lot of punishment. The problem here is Algieri seems to have forgotten. And this happened to Pernell Whitaker in some fights. That offense is expected in boxing. Here he is against Conor Ben. And Conor Ben, let's be hard here, is too front foot heavy. You know he's not going to be on his back foot that much. Let me also say something else, too. If you're old enough, you realize that his father, Nigel Ben, was a bigger puncher than Conor Ben. I'm a little worried for Conor Ben because this reminds me of Joe Fraser with Marvis Fraser. Right? Joe was a bigger puncher. So, if Marvis turned to Joe for advice, right, and this actually happened in a fight, uh, Joe used to be in Marvis's corner, and there's a fight where Joe says to Marvis between rounds, just go in there and rough the guy up. Now, you can do that when you have Joe Fraser's left hook, right? Nigel Benn, go back and look at Nigel Benn's fights, right? Even fights where he didn't do well, the Michael Watson fight. And you're going to see punching power on display, right? Nigel Benn was a blessed puncher with both hands. Now, Conor Benn is fighting the Chris Algieri's of the world, right? Right? Against Chris Algieri, who has forgotten that he's expected to throw and land punches, okay, Conor Ben can come forward, can be on his front foot. But without the Nigel Ben punching ability, and keep in mind, I'm saying this in a fight where he stops Algieri, right? Stops it. But you sense that was the perfect punch. That wasn't his natural punching ability. He's an accumulation puncher. Right? I think Conor Ben is going to have to come up with a plan B and a plan C because he's going to run into real punchers. And you don't want to be the guy walking forward on your front foot against a real puncher who's hoping to be able to find you in the ring. Right? So Conor Ben, hey, I congratulate him. He's very aggressive. He's very front foot heavy. I'm just telling you that as you climb the rungs in boxing and as you face higher ranked, more talented guys, even the punchers have to figure out better defense and how to avoid your punches. Right? You notice Canelo always has his hands up. Right? Canelo's a big puncher. Canelo assumes you're going to be throwing bobs at him. And that's a puncher. Right? Conor Ben needs to work on that part of his game. Against a Chris Algieri, you can drop your hands. You can come forward. You can go hunting him. He's not throwing many punches back. Now Conor Ben is going to be at the part of his career where unless he hits like his father, he's going to have to show more defense. They kept calling him mature on the show and stuff like that. You know what? When you're dealing with elite fighters, you don't even think about talking about maturity. Right? You're, you're watching Lomachenko yesterday. You're not going to say, oh, Lomachenko looks mature this fight. No, no. It's assumed. 
It's assumed. You're in the highest profile fights. You're fighting elite fighters. Your maturity better be assumed. Right? The announcer can't say, oh, he looks mature this fight. What are they saying? You look immature pre you know, prior fights? So Connor Ben, let's just say I was watching him, I thought, okay, decent puncher, not a great puncher. Right? I didn't get the feeling I was watching uh, Golovkin here. Right? Not a great puncher. Decent puncher. He's on his front foot. He's hunting. You know, okay, that worked against Chris Algieri. Right? I'm not sure. I'm not sure if that would work against a Virgil Ortiz. <laughs> okay, let's just let's just be blunt. Right? A Jamel Charlo. I don't I don't think that works then. A Brian Castano. Anyway, those are my thoughts. Let me hear yours. If you feel I've been too hard, go ahead and tell me about it. I concede uh, the bet I won. Uh, the ref could have stopped the fight and, um, you know, I, I would have lost the bet. I'll, I'll concede that. I'll take the win. I'm not giving that back, but I'll concede that. Also, if you feel that I'm selling Canelo short, I know some of you feel I always do, right? Chicano Prophet, I, I hear you. I, I read your comments. Uh, against Bevel, tell us about it in the comment section of this video. Thanks for stopping by.